Hello, welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily, Ostara, and Chloe. As always, I want to remind you, please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. In this next video, we are going to get into several chapters of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And let's, without further ado, let's get there. Okay, we have some short chapters in here, so we're starting out on chapter 11, Pet Cemetery. The next morning at breakfast, Ellie saw the new memo on the bulletin board and asked him what it meant. It means he's going to have a very small operation, Lewis said. He'll probably have to stay over at the vet's for one night afterward. And when he comes home, he'll stay in our yard and not want to roam around so much. Or cross the road, Ellie asked. She may be only five, Lewis thought, but she's sure no slouch. Across the road, he agreed. Yay, Ellie said, and that was the end of the subject. Lewis, who had been prepared for a bitter and perhaps hysterical argument about church being sent out, set, being out of the house for even one night, was mildly surprised by the ease with which she had acquiesced, and he realized how worried she must have been. Perhaps Rachel had not been entirely wrong with the effect the pet cemetery had had on her. Rachel herself, who was feeding Gage, his breakfast egg shot him a grateful, approving look, and Lewis felt something loosen in his chest. That The look told him that the chill was over. This particular hatchet had been buried forever, he hoped. Later, after the big yellow school bus had gobbled Ellie up for the morning, Rachel came to him, put her arms around his neck, and kissed his mouth gently. You were very sweet to do that, she said, and I'm sorry I was such a bitch. Lewis returned her kiss, feeling a little uncomfortable, non- Excuse me. Athlet. Nonetheless, sorry, I only had a brain cramp. It occurred to him that the I'm sorry I was such a bitch statement, while by no means a standard, was not exactly something he'd never heard before either. He usually came after Rachel had gotten her way. Gage, meanwhile, had toddled unsteadily over to the front door and was looking out the lowest pane of glass at the empty road. Bus, he said, hitching nonchalantly at his sagging diapers. Ellie, bus, he's growing up fast, Lewis said. Rachel nodded. Too fast to suit me, I think. Wait until he's out of diapers, Lewis said. Then he can stop. She la laughed, and it was all right be between them again. Completely all right. She stood back, made a minute adjustment to his tie, and looked him up and down critically. Do I pass muster, Sarge, he asked. You look very nice, he said. Yeah, I know, but do I look like a heart surgeon, a $200,000 a year man? No, just old Lou Creed, she said and giggled. A rock and roll animal. Lewis gig glanced at his watch. A rock and roll animal has got to put on his boogie shoes and go, he said. Are you nervous? Yeah, a little. Don't be, she said. It's a sixty-seven thousand dollars a year for putting on ace bandages, prescribing for the flu and for hangovers, giving girls the pill. Don't forget the crab and louse lotion, Lewis said, smiling again. One of the things that had surprised him on his first tour of the infirmary had been the supplies of quell which seemed to him enormous, more fitted to an army base infirmary than to one on a middle-sized university campus. Miss Charlton, the head nurse, had smiled cynically. Off-campus apartments in the area are pretty tacky, you'll see. I think that's what it said. Yeah, you'll see. He supposed he would. Have a good day, she said, and kissed him again, lingeringly. But when she pulled away, she was mock stern, and for Christ's sake, remember that you are an administrator, not intern or second-year resident. Yes, doctor, Lewis said humbly, and they both laughed again. For a minute, he thought of asking, was it Zelda, babe? Is that what got under your skin? Is that the tone, zone of low pressure, Zelda, and how she died? But he wasn't going to ask her that, not now. As a doctor, he knew a lot of things. And while the fact that death was just as natural as childbirth might be, the greatest of them in the fact that you don't monkey with a wound that has finally started to heal was far from the least of them. So instead of asking her, he only kissed her again and went on out. It was a good start, a good day. Maine was putting on a late summer show. The sky was blue and cloudless. The temperature pegged in an utterly perfect 72 degrees, rolling to the end of the driveway and checking for traffic. 
Lewis mused that so far he hadn't seen so much as a trace of the fall foliage that was supposed to be so spectacular, but he could wait. He pointed the Honda Civic they had they had picked up uh, excuse me up as a second car towards the university and let it let it roll. Rachel would call the vet this morning. They would get church fixed, and that would put this whole nonsense of pet cemeteries. Eh, it was funny how that misspelling got into your head, it began to seem right, and death fears behind them. There's no need to be thinking about death on a beautiful September morning like this one. Lewis turned on the b radio and dialed until he found the remote belting out Rockaway Beach. He turned it up and sang along, not well, but with lusty enjoyment. Chapter 12 okay. The first thing he noticed turning into the university grounds is how suddenly and spectacularly the traffic swelled. There was car traffic, bike traffic, there was there were jog joggers by the score. He had to stop quickly to avoid two of the latter coming from the direction of Don Hall. Lewis braked hard enough to lock his shoulder belt and honked. He was always annoying at, annoyed at the ver at the way joggers bicyclers had the same irritating habit, seemed to automatically assume that their responsibility lapsed completely at the moment they began to run. They were, after all, exercising. One of them gave Lewis the finger without ever even looking around. Tch. Lewis sighed and drove on. Excuse me. The next thing was that the ambulance was gone from its slot in the small infirmary parking lot, and that gave him a nasty start. The infirmary was equipped to treat almost any illness or accident on a short-term basis. There were three well-equipped examination and treatment rooms opening off the big foyer, and beyond this were two wards with 15 beds each. But there was no operating theater, nor anything even resembling one in case of serious accidents. There was the ambulance which would rush an injured or seriously ill person to the Eastern Maine Medical Center. Steve Masterson, Masterton, the physician's assistant, who had given Lewis his first tour of this facility, had shown Lewis the log from... <clears throat> The previous two academic years with justifiable pride. There had only been 38 ambulance runs in that time. Not bad when you consider that the student population here was over 10,000 and the total university population was almost 17,000. And here he was on his first real day of work with the ambulance gone. He parked in the slot headed with a freshly painted sign reading reserved for Dr. Creed and hurried in. He found Charlton the graying but lithe woman of about 50 in the first examining room taking the temperature of a girl who was wearing jeans and a halter top. The girl had gotten a bad sunburn not too long ago, Lewis observed. The peeling was well advanced. Good morning, J Joan, he said. Where's the ambulance? Oh, we had a real tragedy, all right, Charlton said, taking the thermometer out of the student's mouth and reading it. Steve Masterton came in this morning at 7, saw a great big puddle under the engine and the front wheel's radiator let go. They hauled it away. Great, Lewis said, but he felt relieved nonetheless. At least it wasn't out on a run, which was what he had first feared. When do we get it back? Joan Charlton laughed. Knowing the university motor pool, she said it'll come back around December 15th, wrapped in Christmas ribbon. She glanced at the student. You've ha got half a degree of a fe fever, she said. Take two aspirins and stay out of bars and dark alleys. The girl got down. She gave Lewis a quick appraising glance and then went out. Our first customer of the new semester, Charlton said sourly. She began to shake the thermometer down with a, with brisk naps. You don't seem too pleased about it. I know the type, she said. Oh, we get the other type, too. Athletes who go on playing with bone chips and tendonitis and everything else because they don't want to be benched. They've got to be macho men, not let the team down. Even if they are jeopardizing pro careers later on, then you've got little Miss Half Degree of Fever. She jerked her head toward the window where Lewis could see the girl with the peeling sunburn walking in the direction of the Gannett Cumberland Androscoggin complex of dorms. In the examining room, the girl had given the impression of being someone who did not feel well at all, but was trying not to let on. Now she was walking briskly, her hips swinging prettily, noticing and being noticed. Your basic college hypochondriac. Shelton dropped the thermometer to sterilize her. We'll see her two dozen times this year. Her visits will be more frequent before each round of prelims, a week or so before finals. She'll be convinced she has either mono or pneumonia. 
bronchitis is the fallback position. She'll get out of four or five tests, the ones where the instructors are wimps to use the word they use, and get easier makeups. They always get sicker if they know the prelim or final is going to be an objective test rather than an essay exam. My aren't we cynical this morning, Lewis said. He was, in fact, a little nonplussed. She tipped him a wink with a, that made him, him grin. I don't take it to heart, doctor, neither should you. With Stephen now, in your office answering mail and trying to figure out the latest ton of bureaucratic bullshit from Blue Cross Blue Shield, she said. Lewis went in. Ch Charlton's cynicism notwithstanding, he felt comfortably in harness. Looking back on it, Lewis would think, when he could bear to think about it at all. The nightmare really began when they brought, brought the dying boy, Victor Pascal, into the infirmary around ten that morning. Until then, things were very quiet. At nine, half an hour after Lewis arrived, the two candy stripers who would be working the nine-to-three shift came in. Lewis gave them each a donut and a cup of coffee and talked to them for about fifteen minutes, outlining their duties. And what was perhaps more important, what was beyond the scope of their duties. Then Charlton took over as she led them out of Lewis's office. Lewis heard her ask, Either of you allergic to shit or puke? You'll see a lot of both here. Oh, God, Lewis murmured and covered his eyes. But he's smiling. A tough old babe like Charlton was not always a li liability. Lewis began filling out the long blue cross blue shield forms, which amounted to a complete m inventory of drug stock and medical equipment. Every year, Steve Masterton said in an aggrieved voice, every goddamn year the same thing. Why don't you write down complete heart transplant facility prox value eight million dollars, Lewis. That'll foozle them. Foozle them. And he was totally engrossed, thinking only marginally that a cup of coffee would go down well when Masterton screamed down the scream from the direction of the foyer waiting room. Lewis, hey Lewis, get out of here, we got a mess. The near panic in Masterton's voice got Lewis's going in a hurry. He bolted out of his chair almost as if he had in some subconscious way been expecting this. His shriek as thin and sharp as a shard of broken glass rose, arose from the direction of Masterton's shout. It was followed by a sharp slap and Charlton saying, stop that old we'll get the hell out of here. Stop it right now. Lewis burst into the waiting room and it was the first, or his first only conscious of the blood. There was a lot of blood. One of the candy stripers was sobbing. The other, pale as cream, had put her fisted hands to the corners of her mouth, pulling her lips into a big, revolted grin. Masterton was kneeling down, trying to hold the head of the boy sprawling, sprawled on the floor. Steve looked up at Lewis, eyes grim and wide and frightened. He tried to speak. Nothing came out. People were congregating at the student medical center's big glass doors, peering in their in, their hands cupped around their faces to cut out the glare. Lewis's mind conjured up an insanely appropriate image, sitting in the living room as a kid of no more than six with his mother in the morning, morning before she went to work, watching the television, watching the old Today Show with Dave Garraway. People were outside, gaping in at Dave and Frank Blair and good old J. Fred Muggs. He looked around and saw other people standing at the window. He couldn't do anything about the doors, but shut... But shut the drapes, he snapped at the candy striper who had screamed. When she didn't move immediately, Charlton slapped her can. Do it, girl. The candy striper got in gear. A moment later, green drapes were jerked across the window. Charlton and Steve Masterton moved instinctively between the boy on the floor and the doors, cutting off the view as best they could. Hard stretcher, doctor, Charlton asked. If we need it, get it, Lewis said, squatting beside Masterton. I haven't even had a chance to look at him. Come on, Charlton said to the girl who had closed the drape. She was pulling the corners of her mouth with her fists again, making the humorless, screaming grin. She looked at Charlton and moaned, Oh, Og! Yeah, oh, Og is right, come on. She gave the girl a hard yank and got her moving, her red and white pinstriped shirt, skirt swishing against her legs. Lewis bent over his first patient at the University of Maine at Orono. He was a young man, age approximately 20, and it took Lewis less than three seconds to make the only diagnosis that mar mattered. The young man was going to die. Half of his head was crushed. His neck had been broken. One collarbone jutted from his swelled and twisted right shoulder from his head. Blood and yellow pussy fluid seeped sluggishly into the carpet. Lewis could see the man's 
brain, whitish, gray, and pulsing through a shattered section of skull. It was like looking through a bro broken window. The incursion was perhaps five centimeters wide. If he had had a baby in his skull, he could almost have birthed it, like Zeus delivering from his forehead. That he, was, that he was still alive at all was incredible, and his mind suddenly heard Judd Crandall saying, Sometimes you could feel it bite your ass. And his mother, dead is dead. He felt the crazy urge to laugh. Dead was dead, all right. That's affirmative, good buddy. Holler for the ambulance, he snapped at Master Tint. Lewis, the ambulance is... Oh, Christ, Lewis said, slapping his own forehead. He shifted his gaze to Charlton. Joan, what do you do in a case like this? Call it campus security or the EMMC? Joan looked flustered and upset and extreme rarity with her. Lewis guessed. But her voice was composed enough as she replied, Doctor, I don't know. We've never had a situation like this before in my time at the medical center. Lewis thought as fast as he could. Call the campus police. We can't wait for EMMC to send out their own ambulance. If they have to, they can take him up to Bangor in one of the fire engines. At least it has the siren flashers. Go do it, Joan. She went out, but not before he caught her deeply sympathetic glance and interpreted it. The young man who was deeply tanned and well-muscled, perhaps from a summer working on a road crew somewhere, or painting houses, or giving Ted lessons, and dressed not only in red gym shorts with white piping, was going to die no matter what they did. He would be just as dead even if their ambulance had been parked out front with the motor idling with a, when the patient was brought in. Incredibly, the dying man was moving. His eyes fluttered and opened. Blue eyes, the, the irises ringed with blood. They stared vacantly around, seeing nothing. He tried to move his head, and Lewis exerted pressure to keep him from doing so, mindful of the broken neck. The cranial trauma did not preclude the possibility of pain. The hole in his head, oh Christ, the hole in his head. What happened to him, he asked Steve, aware that it was under the circumstances a stupid and pointless question. The question of a bystander, but the hole in the man's head confirmed his sta status. Bystander was all he was. Did the police bring him? Some students brought him in a blanket sling. I don't know what the circumstances were. There was what happened next to be thought of. That was his responsibility, too. Go out and find them, Lewis said. Take them around to the other door. I want them handy, but I don't want them to see any more of this than, they've already, than they already have. Masterton looked relieved to be away from what has, was happening in here, went to the door and opened it, letting in a babble of excited, curious, confused com conversation. Lewis could also hear the wobble of a siren, police siren. Excuse me. Campus uh, security was here then. Lewis felt a kind of miserable relief. The dying man was making a gurgling sound in his throat. He tried to speak. Lewis heard syllables, if phonetics at least, but the words themselves were slurred and unclear. Lewis leaned over and said, You're going to be all right, fella. He thought of Rachel and Ellie as he said it, and his stomach gave a great, unlovely lurch. He put a hand over his mouth and stifled a burp. Ka, the young man said, Ka. Lewis looked around and saw that he was momentarily alone with the dying man. Dimly, he could hear Joan Charlton yelling at the candy stripers that the hard stretcher was in the supply closet off room two. Lewis doubted if they knew room two from a frog's gonads. It was, after all, their first day on the job. They had gotten a hell of an introduction to the world of medicine. The green walled wall carpet was now soaked in muddy purple in an expanding circle around the young man's ruined head. The leakage of intracranial fluid immersively stopped. In the pet cemetery, the young man croaked, and he began to grin. This grin was remarkably like the mirthless, hysterical grin of the candy striper who had closed the drapes. Lewis stared down at him at first, refusing to credit what he heard, had heard. Then Lewis thought he must have had an auditory hallucination. He made some more, more of those phonetic sounds and... My subconscious made them into something coherent, cross-patched the sounds into my own experience. But that was not what had happened, and a moment later he forced, was forced to realize it. A swooning, mad terror struck him, and his flesh began to creep avidly, seeming to actually move up and down his arms 
and long his belly in waves, but even then he simply refused to believe it. Yes, the syllables had been on the bloody lips of the man on the carpet as well as in Lewis's ears, but that only meant the hallucination had been visual as well as auditory. What did you say, he whispered, and this time as clear as the words of a speaking parrot or a crow whose tongue had been split. The words were unmistakable. It's not the real cemetery. The eyes were vacant, not seeing, rimmed with blood, the mouth grinning, the large grin of a dead carp. Horror rolled through Lewis, gripping his warm heart in its cold hands, squeezing it, reduced him, made him less and less until he felt like taking his heel to his heels and running from this bloody, twisted, squeaking head on the floor of the infirmary waiting room. He was a man with no deep religious training, no bent toward the superstition, superstitious or the occult. He was ill-prepared for this, whatever it was. Fighting the urge to run with their, everything in him, he forced himself to lean even close. What did you say, he asked the second time? The grin, that was bad. The soil of a man's heart is stonier, Lewis, the dying man whispered. A man grows what he can and tends it. Lewis, he thought, hearing nothing but his conscious mind after his own name. Oh, my God, he called me by my name. Who are you, Lewis asked in a trembling, papery voice. Who are you? Injun, bring my fish. How did you know my... Keep it... Keep clear us. Now, no. You? Ka, the young man said, and now Lewis fancied he could smell death on his breath. Internal injuries, lost rhythm, failure, ruin. What? A crazy urge came to shake him. God, the young man in the red gym shorts, began to shudder all over. Suddenly he seemed to freeze with every muscle locked. His eyes lost their vacant expression momentarily and seemed to find Lewis's eyes. Then everything let go at once. There was a bad stink. Lewis thought he would, thought he would, must speak again. Then the eyes resumed their vacant expression and began to glaze. The man was dead. Lewis sat back, vaguely aware that all his clothes was stinking was sticking to him. He was drenched with sweat. Darkness bloomed, spreading a long a uh, wing uh, softly over his eyes, and the world began to swing sickeningly sideways, recognizing what was happening. He half turned from the dead man, thrust his head down between his knees and pressed the nails of his left thumb and left forefinger under his gums hard enough to bring blood. After a moment, the world began to clear again. We're on chapter 13. Oops. I'm writing backwards. Chapter 13. Then the room began, then the room filled up with people as if they were all only actors waiting for their cue. This added to Lewis's feeling of <coughs> this added to Lewis's feeling of unreality and disorientation. The strength of those feelings, of these feelings, which he had studied in psychology classes, but never actually experienced, frightened him badly. Was he supposed the way a person would feel shortly after someone had slipped a powerful dose of LSD into his drink? Like a play staged only for my benefit, he thought. The room is first conveniently cleared so the dying Sybil can speak a few lines of oblique prophecy to me and me alone, and as soon as he's dead, everyone comes back. <laughs> the candy stripe is bungled in, one on each end of the hard stretcher, the one that they used for people with spinal and neck injuries, or neck injuries. Joan Charlton followed them, saying that the campus police were on their way. The young man had been struck by a car while jogging. Lewis thought of the joggers who had run in front of his car that morning, and his guts rolled. Behind Charlton came Steve Masterton with two campus security cops. Lewis, the, the people who brought Pascal went in are, are broke off and said sharply, Lewis, are you all right? I'm okay, he said, and got up. Faintness washed over him again, then withdrew. He wrote, Pasco was his name. One of the campus cops said, Vic Victor Pasco, according to the girl he was jogging with. Lewis glanced at his watch and subtracted two minutes from the room where Masterton had sequestered the people who had brought Pasco in. He could hear a girl sobbing wildly 
Welcome back to school, little lady. He thought, have a nice semester. Mr. Pascal died at 10.09 a.m., he said. One of the cops wiped the back of his hand across his mouth. Masterton said again, Lewis, are you really okay? You look terrible. Lewis opened his aunt mouth to answer, and one of the candy stripers abruptly dropped her end of the hard stretcher and ran out, vomiting down the front of her pinafore. Phone began to ring. The girl who had been sobbing now began to scream the dead man's name. Vic, 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 over and over. Bedlam, confusion. One of the cops was asking Charlton if they could have a blanket to cover him up. And Charlton was saying she didn't even, didn't know if she had the authority to requisition one. And Lewis found himself thinking of a line from Maurice Sendak. Let the wild rumpus start. I just requisition it. Damn it. Those rotten giggles rose in his throat again. And somehow he managed to bottle them up. Had this Pascal really said the... Word pet, words Pet Cemetery? Had this Pascal really spoken his name? Those were the things that were knocking him off kilter. The things that had sent him wobbling out of orbit, but already his mind seemed to be wrapping, under, wrapping those few moments in a protective film. Sculpting, changing, disconnecting, surely he had said something else. If he had indeed spoken at all, and in the shock and unhappy position of the moment lewis had misinterpreted it more likely pascal had only mouthed words as he had at first thought lewis groped for himself for the that part of himself that had caused the administration to give him this job over the other 53 applicants for the position there's no one in the command here in command here no forward motion the room was full of milling people steve go give that girl a trank he said and just saying the words made him feel better. It was as if he were in a rocket ship under power now, pulling away from a tiny moonlit. Said moonlit being, of course, though that irrational moment when Pasco had spoken, Lewis had been hired to take charge. He was going to do it. Joan, give the girl a copper blanket. Doctor, we have an inventory. Give it to him anyway. Then check on that candy striper. He looked at the other girl who was still held her end of the hard stretcher. She was staring at Pascal's remains with a kind of hypnotized fascination. Candy striper, Lewis said harshly, and her eyes jerked away from the body. Whoa, whoa, what's the other girl's name? Whoa, who? The one who puked, he said with deliberate harshness. J -j Judy, Judy D'Alessio, your name? Carla. Now the girl sounded a little more steady. Carla, you go check on Judy and get that blanket. You'll find a pile of them in that little utility closet half examining room one. Go all of you. Let's look a little professional here. They got moving. Very shortly, the screaming in the other room quieted. The phone, which had stopped ringing, now began, began again. Lewis pushed the hold button without picking up the receiver off its cradle. The older cop, campus cop looked more together, and spoke, Lewis spoke to him. Who do we notify? Can you give me a list? The cop nodded and said, We haven't had one of these in six years. It's a bad way to start the semester. semester. Sure is, Lewis said. He picked up the phone and punched off the hold button. Hello, who is? An exciting voice began. And Lewis cut it off. He began to make his calls. And we're in chapter 14. There we go. Chapter 14. Things did not slow down until nearly four that afternoon after Lewis and Richard Irving, the head of campus security, made a statement in the press. The young man, Victor Pascoe, had been jogging with two friends, one of them his fiance. A car driven by Tremont Withers, 23 of Haven, Maine, had come up the road le leading from the Lengel Women's Gymnasium toward the center of campus at an, excessive, at an excessive speed. Withers' car had struck Pascoe and driven him headfirst into a tree. Pascoe had been brought to the infirmary in a blanket by his friends and two passerby. He had died minutes later. Withers was being held pending char charges of reckless driving, driving under the influence and vehicular ma manslaughter. The editor of the campus newspaper asked if he could say that Pasco had died of head injuries. Lewis, thinking of the broken window through which the brain itself could be seen, said he would rather let the Penobscot County coroner announce the cause of death. The editor then asked if the four young people who had brought Pasco to the infirmary in the blanket might not have inadvertently caused his death. No, Lewis replied, not at all. Unhappily, Mr. Pasco was, in my opinion, mortally wounded upon being struck. They were. There were other questions, a few, but that really ended the press conference. Now Lewis sat in his office. Steve Masterton had gone home 
an hour before immediately following the press conference. To catch himself on the evening news, Lewis suspected, trying to pick up the shards of the day, or maybe he was just trying to cover what had happened, to paint a thin coat of routine over it. He and Charlton were going over the cards in the front file, those students who were pushing grimly through their college years in spite of some disability. There were 23 diabetics in the front file, 15 epileptics, 14 paraplegics, and assorted others. Students with leukemia, students with cerebral palsy and muscular dystrophy, blind students, two mute students, and one case of sickle cell anemia, which Lewis had never seen, never even seen. Perhaps the lowest point of the afternoon had come just after Steve left. Bangor came in and, excuse me, Charlton came in and laid a pink memo slip on Lewis's desk. Bangor carpet will be here at 9, 8, 9 tomorrow, it read. Carpet, he'd asked. Will have to be replaced, she said apologetically. No way the stain's going to come out, doctor. Of course not. At that point, Lewis had gone into the dispensary and taken a tu tunnel, what his first med school roommate had called tuners. Hop up on the Tunerville trolley, Lewis, he'd say, and I'll put on some credence. More often than not, Lewis had declined the ride in the fabled Tunerville, and that was maybe just as well. His roommate had flunked out halfway through his third semester and had ridden the Tunerville trolley all the way to Vietnam as a medical corpsman. Oof. Lewis sometimes pictured him over there, stoned to the eyeballs, listening to Credence do Run Through the Jungle. But he needed something. If he was going to have to see that pink slip about the carpet on his note minder board every time he glanced up from the front file spread out in front of them, he needed something. He was cruising fairly well when Mr... Mrs. Bailings, the night nurse, poked her head and said, Your wife, Dr. Creed, lied in one. Lewis glanced at his watch and saw it was nearly 5.30. He had meant to be out of here an hour and a half ago. Okay, Nancy, thanks. He picked up the phone and punched his line one. Hi, honey, just on my... Lewis, are you all right? Yeah, fine. Heard it about on the news, Lou. I'm so sorry. She paused a moment. It was on the radio news. They had, had you on answering some questions. You sounded fine. Did I? Good. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, Rachel, I'm fine. Come home, she said. Yes, he said. Home sounded good to him. That's the end of chapter 14. All right, let's see what we got for 15. Maybe I'll read it now or not. Yeah, we'll read it. Chapter 15. She met him at the door and his jaw dropped. She was wearing the net bra he liked, a pair of semi-transparent panties and nothing else. You look delicious, he said. What, where are the kids? Missy Dandridge took them. We are on our own and until until 8.30, which gives us two and a half hours. Let's not waste it. She pressed against him. He could smell a faint, lovely scent. Was it a tar of roses? His arms went around her, first around her waist, and then his hands found her buttocks as her tongue danced lightly over his lips and then into his mouth. Licking and darting. At last, their kiss broke, and he asked her a bit hoarsely, Are you for dinner? Dessert, she said, and then began to rotate her lower body slowly and sensuously against his groin and abdomen. But I promise you, you don't have to eat anything you don't like. He reached for her, but she slipped out of his arms and took his hands. Upstairs first, she, she said. She drew him an extremely warm bath, then dressed him slowly and shooed him into the water. She donned the slightly rough sponge glove. They usually hung unused on the shower. Ted soaked his body gently, then rinsed it. You could feel the day, this horrible first day, slipping slowly off off him. She had gotten quite wet. Panties clung like a second skin. Lewis started to get out of the tub, and she pushed him back gently. What? Now the sponge glove gripped him gently, gently, but with almost unbearable friction, moving slowly up and down. Rachel, sweat had broken all over him, and not just from the heart, heat of the tub. Shh! Seemed to go on almost eternally. He would not, he would near climax, and the hand in the, and the, and the sponge glove would slow, almost stop. Then it didn't stop, but squeezed, loosened, again, uh, loosened, squeezed again, until he came so strongly that he felt his eardrums bulge. My God, he said shakily when he could speak again. Where did you learn that? Girl Scout, she said primly. She had made a stroganoff which had been simmering during the bathtub episode, and Lewis, who would have sworn at four o'clock that he would not, that he would next want to eat sometime around Halloween, ate two helpings. Then she led him upstairs again. Now, she said, let's see what you can do for me. 
All things considered, Lewis thought he rose to the occasion quite well. Afterward, Rachel dressed in her old blue pajamas. Lewis pulled on a flannel shirt, nearly shapeless corduroy pants, what Rachel called his grubs, and went after the kids. Missy Dandridge wanted to know about the accident. Lewis stretched it, sketched it in for her, giving her less than she would probably read in the Bangor Daily News the following day. He didn't like doing it. It made him feel like the most rancid sort of gossip, but Missy would accept no money for sitting, and he was grateful to her for the evening he had he and Rachel had shared. Gage was, uh, was asleep before Lewis had gotten the mile between Missy's house and their own. Even Ellie was yawning and glassy-eyed. He put Gage into fresh diapers, poured him into a sleeper suit, and popped him into his crib. Then he read Ellie a story book. As usual, the, she clamored for where the wild things are, being a veteran wild thing herself. Lewis convinced her to settle for the cat in the hat. She was asleep five minutes after he carried her up, and Rachel tucked her in. When he came downstairs again, Rachel was sitting in the living room with a glass of milk. A Dorothy Sayers mystery was open on one long thigh. Lewis, are you really all right? Honey, I'm fine, he said, and thanks for everything. We aim to please, she said with a curving, slightly saucy smile. Are you going over to Judd's for a beer? He shook his head. Not tonight. I'm totally bushed. I hope I had something to do with that. I think you did. Then grab yourself a glass of milk, doctor, and let's go to bed. He thought perhaps he would lie awake as he often had when he was interning and days that were particularly hairy would play over and over in his mind but he had he slid smoothly towards sleep as if on a slightly inclined frictionless board. He had read, read somewhere that it takes the average human being just seven minutes to turn off all the switches and uncouple from the day. Seven minutes for conscious and unsubconscious to revolve like the trick wall it, while an amusement park haunted house, something a little eerie in that. He was almost there when he heard Rachel say, as if from a great distance, day after tomorrow. Um, Joe Lander, the vet, he's taking church the day after tomorrow. Oh, church. Treasure your cajonies while you got them, church old boy. Then he slipped away from everything, down a hole, sleeping deeply, without dreams. It's the end of chapter 15, and we'll stop there for today. And it looks like we're finally starting to get somewhere in the book. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And be sure to join me in the next installment of in chapter 16 of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And you have a great night. Thank you.